there are sometimes molecules that will interfere, even, even fiber in a diet will interfere with the absorption through the gastrointestinal tract, and then they will be excreted uh, um, through the, through the uh, digestive system. And, and again, sometimes you can get a significant amount of reduction. For example, for aflatoxin, we can consistently with a good uh, uh, product, we can reduce up to 50, 60% of the aflatoxin that is going to be uh, delivered into the milk. Uh, creating you know a, a great benefit for a dairy producer that could potentially lose that whole tank of milk to to a positive test. Uh, in in other instances, it could be as ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty percent reduction. That maybe we convince ourselves that that's not good enough, but maybe that's the difference between a clinical sign or or just animals having to cope with it a little bit more. You're you're giving it every chance you can to to uh, pass through this event. everyone, this is Luis Ferrero with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we will be discussing mycotoxins in dairy feeds. And to help us tackle this very complex topic, we have Dr. Duarte Diaz, Professor and Dairy Extension Specialist from the University of Arizona. And obviously Duarte is very skilled in this topic and we will provide a lot of great information. But before we get into uh, this discussion, Duarte, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin our discussion, can you provide a brief background about yourself? Yes. Uh, thank you, Luis. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with, with you guys and with all the listeners. Um, brief background. I'm, I'm actually a non-ag kid. I, I grew up parents that were academics and uh, did not get into agriculture into graduate school. So uh, as a graduate student, it was the first time I stepped into a in a production facility. Um, it was unique for me because it gave me a different perspective than a lot of my students. I didn't come with a, that traditional background, but um, it was also a pretty steep learning curve. So I went to North Carolina State University, both, both my master's and, and my PhD. I uh, did some postdoctoral work in Italy at uh, Catholic University in Piacenza and the University of Bologna, and then started my academic venture at Utah State University. Um, Spent a couple of years in the industry and then back to academia in Arizona, where I've been for the last 10 years. Adiseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M, the best in-class rumen-protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain the lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, Go to milkpay.com. Perfect. So let's let's start this discussion by bringing, a, let's say, a, a slightly more complex topics, right? Obviously, mycotoxin is something that affects pretty much every dairy uh, or has potential to affect every dairy. But how does that vary by region or by season, climate changes and things like that? Yeah, a couple of things are important to, to set the stage. First of all, is that often we, we are, it's pretty easy to say the word mycotoxin without uh, realizing that when we're talking about mycotoxins, we're talking about hundreds of different compounds produced by a really broad range of different uh, fungi uh, in, in the system. So so it's it's uh, nearly impossible to generalize and say this is how all of them work. But in general, there is um, we're, we're talking about an interaction that occurs between the plant, the soil, and the environment. And depending on the specific uh, of each different mold being a favorite substrate, favorite climate, uh, lack of uh, more aggressive competitors, then you still you start seeing dominance of specific species in different regions of the world. So you have uh, moles and that produce mycotoxins that are more aggressive in the tropical and subtropical regions, like Aspergillus and some fusarium, uh, fusarium that will produce aflatoxin and fumonacin. While in a little bit more of the, the more uh, colder climates, you start seeing more dominance of fusariums. Um, Fusarium gabinarum, primarily, that will more likely produce DONs and zeralone and, and, and other of those mycotoxins. Also to note is that you also have to remember that, that even in the field or at the uh, grain bin or even at the feed bunk, we create micro ecosystems. 
And within those micro ecosystems, we have a whole bunch of these these moles because they're they're part of the environment. But as the as the climate in that micro uh, ecosystem changes, you can you can now start creating dominance of a different species that may not be the favorite one of that geographical region. And that's why we found we find pretty much every mycotoxin in every region of the world where there is significant amount of crop production. So you mentioned a little bit about bunker and grain beans and uh, the, the perspective of having those uh, different systems uh, causing different issues. So what are the most common feeds that are susceptible to mycotoxins? Obviously, we think about corn silage, but besides corn silage, what are some of the feeds that we have to be more careful about? I think contamination uh, of individual feedstuffs needs to be built into what a basic risk assessment model would be. Uh, contamination can be led by two primary things. First, it's a suitable substrate, like that mole likes to be in that uh, specific environment. Um, and, and second of all, the frequency of the crop production of that, right? So, so we see a lot of mycotoxins in corn. It's a suitable substrate, but it's also widely produced in very uh, large regions around the world. So that makes for a perfect high-risk environment in that context, right? We have other commodities that are um, equally high volume produced, but are less risk because they're not as good of a substrate like soybean, for example. So when you do a, a, a assessment of feedstuff, one of the primary things that I do is I look at ingredients by level of risk of contamination. So frequency of contamination. So again, we have things like cotton seed that can be often uh, contaminated with, with aflatoxin, or we have other substrates like you know, if you're using a byproduct of the peanut industry, where the nut is underground, exposed to the fungi, you know, that's a high risk uh, substrate, especially for aflatoxin. And then when you start looking regionally, you start separating those feedstuffs. Like the even within an individual ingredient like corn, you can have also differences in um, a, as a viable substrate. So, for example, you have these, um, you know, corn silage varieties where the corn actually comes out of the, the stalk actually comes out of the covering, right? Well, that's a that's a really viable um, substrate for, for a mold because that covering was the first line of defense in preventing that that corn from, I mean, that mold from, from establishing there. So things like that uh, are, are really important. Also is these cofactors that make susceptible ingredients. So for example, there's a really high correlation with uh, things like insect damage, or in my region, high temperatures, because those actually create macro or micro fractures into the individual kernels that allow the, the mold to penetrate and be more, more aggressive in the, in the, in the part of the, of, the, of the substrate that they actually like. So there's a lot of variation in that, but, but we, can, we, can, we can segment the dot and actually look at things in a risk management um, scenario when I go into a herd, I go in there, it's like, okay, these are the five ingredients that I would put at the top of my high risk ingredients. Let's let's tackle those first. I think that's a great suggestion. Um, and for the farmers out there that have some uh, worries about having mycotoxins, how do they figure out if they do have that? What are the best methods that can be used to assess if mycotoxin is present? A diagnostic in general is tricky, right? Because we have organisms, you know, we have these compounds that cause very basic damage in the animal of physiology that are, or, or biochemistry that are really difficult to target as, as, as spe with specific symptoms. Maybe xeralanone being a, the exception where you start seeing swelling of reproductive organs or even uh, early development of the mammary gland in some, some very severe cases. Um, but what you want to do is, again, you include mycotoxins in your general overall um, risk assessment, risk management protocol in your farm, right? You say, given the right conditions, mold can grow in my feedstuff, and given the right condition, that mold can actually produce those mycotoxins. And then you do an exercise where you eliminate very common issues, right? Nutritional deficiencies, vaccination protocols, health issues, because those tend to potentiate any potential mycotoxin uh, contamination, right? We have a mycotoxin that is immunosuppressive, and you have an issue with your vac vaccination protocol, those things will combine to cause a much more uh, severe uh, outbreak in the farm. But I, I think in general, what I try to tell farmers is that it's neither the extreme or the 
uh, close my eyes and it's not a problem, right? We always make this joke that the easiest way not to have mycotoxins is not to test for them. Because the more you test, the more likely you're going to find them because they're, they're, they're pretty ubiquitous. So what you want to do is you want to convince people that it's it's part of the risks that are in, in the herd, in the, in, the, in the production system. And then uh, within that, you put it in your, in your standardized uh, evaluation protocol. Do a mycotoxin evaluation every once in a while. Compare your uh, production with that mycotoxin evaluation. Look at your feed stuff. There's many times where the feed stuff is not feeding very well, and you can see that it's you know it's deteriorated or it's moldy or it's looking at that. The downside of that is that a lot of people will like to use visual cues to estimate mycotoxin issues. And in general, I would tell you the most common question I get all the time is, I sent a sample to the lab, it was full of mold, it came back with no mycotoxins. And I tell them, yeah, and to me it makes perfect sense. If the mold was growing, it wasn't stress. It wasn't producing mycotoxins. It's when the mold starts getting stress that it starts producing the mycotoxins. So that there's a very little correlation between those, those two events. It's probably the part that you don't see bad that is, is, is giving you the problems. So again, I, I tend to not be an alarmist about mycotoxins. I'm very glad that it takes me to dairy herds, but it normally takes me to dairy herds to identify two or three other issues that have combined to lead to this, this major thing. Uh, and in essence, if it's something like a poorly fermented silage or, or ingredient that didn't store, then we can work on, okay, this happened this year. What can we do next year to be more proactive about trying to, to mitigate uh, the, the, the favorable environment for, the, for those conditions? Unlock whole herd performance with Zimpro Isofront. This one-of-a-kind technology enhances rumen performance and advances efficiency by directly feeding the rumen microbes. What's the result? Decreased dry matter intake, increased energy corrected milk, better feed efficiency, and a herd that is better equipped to navigate the stress of lactation phases and seasonal change. Learn more at zinpro.com forward slash isofirm. And for the farmers that identify that they have an issue, are there any feed additives or binders that can be used to mitigate uh, the effects of those mycotoxins? Yeah, this is also a really broad area. Um, we, we've done a lot of research over the years on the utilization of, I call sequestering agents, because to me, to me, defining it as a binding, there, there has to be a binding occurring. There are sometimes molecules that will interfere, even, even fiber in a diet will interfere with the absorption through the gastrointestinal tract, and then they will be excreted uh, um, through the, through the uh, digestive system. And, and again, sometimes you can get a significant amount of reduction. For example, for aflatoxin, we can consistently, with a good uh, uh, product, we can reduce up to 50, 60% of the aflatoxin that is gonna be uh, delivered into the milk, uh, creating you know, a, a great benefit for a dairy producer that could potentially lose that whole tank of milk to, to a positive test. Uh, in, in other instances, it could be a 10%, 15%, 20% reduction that maybe we convince ourselves that that's not good enough, but maybe that's the difference between a clinical sign or, or just animals having to cope with it a little bit more. You're, you're giving it every chance you can to, to uh, pass through this event. Usually a mycotoxicosis is a contaminated period of time, right? Where if you can get them passed through that time, then they'll, they'll recover uh, eventually. Outside of that, I also think that it's really important to consider what organs the mycotoxins target, right? We talked a little bit about immunosuppression. Want to make sure that oxidative stress is, is thought about in that, in that, in that instance. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to feed antioxidants um, or to, un, or, or to uh, evaluate whether your antioxidant supplementation in that diet is adequate, or if you want to bump it a little bit more. Again, the liver is a primary target for some of these mycotoxins. So again, you want to be able to understand, can I do something to improve hepatic health uh, and help this animal cope uh, through that? And then the third one, which I think is also really important is, is uh, at the gastrointestinal tissue level, many mycotoxins are irritants. I mean, that's the primary mechanisms. I think mycotoxins in many cases pr are produced to irritate the skin of the kernel next door so that I can get in. And that same irritating uh, uh, quality is what causes intestinal irritation. So if we can improve intestinal health, right, feeding something that maybe 
will uh, reduce the microbial load or, you know, utilizing something that will stabilize the, my, the, the microbial population or even protein, right, to, to regenerate uh, tissue. Um, there, there's a lot of things that you can do through the dietary intervention that could that could alleviate or could give the opportunity to the animal uh, to 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 cope with it. And among those are yeah these, these specialized products that are are targeted to reduce some of the absorption through the gastrointestinal tissue. Absolutely. So I guess uh, the take home message is every single layer of protection against mycotoxins matters. So I think that's great advice because there's so much going on and certainly the cows deserve the the better. Uh, Dorothy, thanks again for joining us today. I'm sure that people at home will truly enjoy all those advices that you shared with us. For you at home, thank you very much for uh, joining us in the podcast and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.